This is the first time <laughs> I've had an opportunity to be back in the room with our panel. So excuse me while I learn how to use our new mute buttons. Uh, good morning from Washington, DC. My name is Lauren Reese, and together with my colleagues in the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program, it's my privilege to welcome you to this morning's event. Uh, this is the first time that we are back in person, some of us, um, and it's a real pleasure to be with two of our three panelists today, as well as some special guests. I want to thank the Wilson Center's external relations and AV teams who have been working tirelessly to make this possible, uh, to make ensure that we're safe and that we're also allowed to uh, able to bring in the extraordinary expertise and insights of our virtual audience. So thank you all for tuning in. For those of, the, of uh, you joining us just for the first time, I want to say a quick word about the Wilson Center. The Wilson Center is the living memorial to President Wilson, who was both a scholar and a policymaker. Uh, we have about 15 programs that focus on different topics and regions. I direct the Environmental Change and Security Program, which is focused on connecting the intersection of environment and security to foreign policy and, and uh, international development. For today's event, we are grateful for the co-sponsorship of our Africa, Asia, Global Europe, Latin American, and Middle East programs, our Canada, Kenan, Mexico, and Polar Institutes, and our China Environment Forum. And for good reason. Today we're talking about new ways of thinking about what constitutes international order and how it can be applied to some of today's most pressing issues. Dr. Jeff Colgan is going to share with us insights from his latest book, we have it right here, Partial Hegemony, and uh, Oil Politics and International Order. And we've invited two discussants, the Honorable uh, Bob Schur and the Professor Elizabeth Saunders to share their reflections on Jeff's book and how it relates to their own work. I'm gonna say up front that I have read the book and it, it includes a lot of ex extraordinary insights. It's very enlightening. Um, in a recent article, Wilson Center VP, uh, senior VP Rod Litvak took on what he called the twin existential threats of nuclear war and climate change, arguing that the nexus between geostrategic competition and climate change must be understood and integrated in policy if we are to avoid both threats. Jeff's book offers a fresh approach to designing new international governing arrangements that I think gets at the challenge that Rob put forth in his article. When we settled on the date for this event back in the fall, I don't think we could have uh, imagined what this moment in time was gonna feel like. The twin threats that uh, Rob references are more pronounced than ever. Putin's aggression, including a nuclear threat and the crisis in Ukraine are devastating, but we're also seeing a reinvigorated NATO, a reassertion of US leadership, a strengthened EU resolve, uh, not to mention the inspirational leadership of President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people. Also this week, the IPCC released its latest report on climate change written by 270 experts in 67 countries. The report ends with this dire warning. Any further delay in concerted anticipatory global action on climate, or, I'm sorry, on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. So now is a very important time for this conversation. We'll hear first from Dr. Colgan, who will present his book. Jeff is the Richard Holbrook Associate Professor of Political Science at Brown University and the founding director of the Climate Solutions Lab at Brown. We were lucky to have him in, in residence here at the Wilson Center nearly 10 years ago and always glad to welcome him back. Dr. Elizabeth Saunders is an Associate Professor in the School of Foreign Service and a core faculty member in the Security Studies Program at Georgetown. She's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a senior editor at the Washington Post's political science blog, The Monkey Cage. She was also a scholar here at the Wilson Center just uh, under 10 years, or uh, yeah, just under 10 years ago at the same time as Jeff, and so it's, it's great to have our alumni return. The Honorable Bob Schur is the head of international affairs for BP America, where he tracks and analyzes US foreign and national security policy as it affects BP's businesses around the world. So Bob's been busy. Uh, before joining BP, Bob was the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans, and Capabilities for the Obama administration. Uh, Jeff, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Lauren. And I do have that feeling of kind of having the band back again, uh, together again. Um, it's lovely to be back uh, at the Wilson Center uh, and to have um, Lauren and Elizabeth and uh, Miles Kaler, uh, who are also a fellow at, at the same time. Uh, so it's really a, a pleasure. Uh, I've been researching and writing this book for the better part of eight years now. Uh, and so it is lovely to come across the finish line and be able to share with you some of what I've learned. Uh, and so that's what I want to do today. And of course, uh, 
uh, the topic that's on uh, everybody's mind uh, is um, is Ukraine, and I don't seem to be able to do slides yet. So, awesome. Okay, uh, and so. Um, there's lots to say about how energy uh, is affecting uh, international order and affecting the, the crisis in Ukraine right now from Russia's petroaggression, which is actually the title of the book that I wrote while I was here as a fellow uh, at the Wilson Center, uh, to Nord Stream 2 and uh, all of the kind of uh, energy dependence issues um, that are uh, important, and I actually have been writing on those uh, as well in the last week, uh, but I did want to spend today uh, stepping back and thinking more about the general framework by which we should understand changes in international order, uh, not just of this very violent kind that we're seeing uh, right now, or at least challenges, uh, but um, uh, of a different type as well. And so uh, the book uh, starts, the story of this book really starts with the largest transfer, peaceful transfer of wealth across borders in all of human history, uh, which began in 1973. And up until that point, this uh, group of international oil companies known as the Seven Sisters uh, controlled the vast majority of the world's oil reserves uh, and production. And that gave them enormous power over um, countries like Iran and Venezuela, they essentially controlled the budgets, the government budgets of those countries. And so then a little organization called OPEC got together and helped its member countries turn the tables on what were at the time the most powerful companies in the world. And it was a huge shift in international order which reverberated for years uh, um, afterwards. Uh, and the reason or part of what that represented in terms of a shift in international order was that the governing arrangements in oil had changed quite dramatically. And one way of seeing that uh, is to look at the um, volatility in the price of oil over time. And so what this graph gives you is not the price, but the month-to-month -month change in the price uh, of oil over the last 150 years or so that, uh, that oil has been a major commodity. And for most of that time, oil prices have been very volatile, just as they are right now, right? We're seeing huge volatility in oil prices. Um, but there was a period from roughly the mid-1930s to early 1970s uh, where the price of oil was remarkably consistent. It was controlled very effectively by the Seven Sister Companies. And you can say whether that was good or bad, but they, they were effective governing arrangements uh, where the, the price, um, in fact, in the 1960s, the whole decade didn't change by even a penny per barrel for the whole 1960s. So there was incredible control over the price of oil during this period. Uh, and then that order fell apart. It changed. Uh, and so that really brings to mind some questions about what are the conditions under which we can have effective governing arrangements? And then why do they change? Why do they, why do they fall apart uh, uh, sometimes? And the stakes to this are really high, right? Because international order affects so much of what we do in terms of what we eat and what cities we travel to and how we invest our savings and all of the rest. Uh, and so just to be kind of pedantic about this and say, okay, what's our definition here of, of international order? Unfortunately, there are many, many definitions uh, in international relations about what we mean by international order. I'm going to pick one very prominent one that I think um, borrow from John Eikenberry, the idea that order are the governing arrangements among a group of states, including its fundamental rules, principles, and institutions as manifested by things like the UN or the World Bank or the WTO, et cetera. Uh, and if you look for, okay, so what's, what do we know about why, these, why does order change? We can have a kind of standard IR 101 model uh, of change, which is that there's, at some point in time, a big war, like World War II, and out of that war, the victor becomes a hegemon, meaning the leading state, that then gets to set the rules of the post-war order. That's our basic model, right? And there is some debate uh, uh, theoretically about exactly how that operates and how it declines, et cetera. 
but most of our big theories agree that hinge years like 1815, 1918, 1945, these are the crucial years, and that great powers are the ones that really drive changes. The problem with this theory is that the events I just told you about in 1973 don't fit very well, right? That they, uh, they don't fit for three reasons. Uh, that uh, one, there wasn't a major power war in 1973, the great powers weren't the ones driving the changes. In fact, the, the United States was actively resisting what was happening in 1973, didn't want it to happen. Uh, and uh, it wasn't just states that mattered, right? That it was also non-state actors like firms and OPEC and other international organizations that matter. And so the, the point of this is to say, look, actually, if you start looking through history, it's not just 1973, but there are other anomalies as well. We're not getting a little bit of feedback here, uh, uh, audio feedback. But the idea um, uh, of going back to this theory is to say, OK, well, what do we really mean by hegemon? Uh, and uh, IR scholars turn out to be amazingly bad at defining this term, unlike international order, where there's like a 1,000 definitions. Uh, most people just say hegemon, oh, yeah, that's just the leading state. Uh, and they treat it as kind of an on-off switch. And if, you're, if you are the hegemon, then you're hegemonic across all kinds of dimensions of power, where you're dominant militarily, you're the biggest economy, you're the leading technological state, you control natural resource flows, capital flows, information flows, all kinds of things. Right? And in reality, of course, uh, a state could lead in some of these dimensions, but not all of them. Uh, and that's the world I think we're in today, and it's also the condition that I call partial hegemony. Right? and hence the title uh, uh, of the book. And so, okay, if we take that seriously, what does that mean? Can we just kind of plug that back into our theory and be okay? Well, no. Uh, and uh, part of the reason that it's not so easy to, to figure out what's going on with international order is that we can't even agree whether international order is changing, let alone why it's changing, right? So if you look at foreign affairs or foreign policy these days, the pages are full of not only scholars, but also policymakers arguing about whether international order is changing or to what extent, right? And so you have some people saying, look, this is you know completely, the liberal order is coming apart and the trade system is falling apart and the rise of China. And then you have others say, look, the fundamentals here about the US military power and the breadth of the allies and dollar hegemony, these are all still intact. You know, nothing's fundamentally changed. I think this is fundamentally an irreconcilable debate so long as we are thinking about international order as one thing, as a single monolithic thing. And hence the idea of trying to think in terms of subsystems. And a lot of this book is about developing a theory around what, it, what does it mean to have subsystems of international order. Uh, and so I think about uh, the whole world as being a series of kind of overlapping and interconnected subsystems, which are a collection of state and non-state actors orbiting around um, particular questions of governance, sort of fun functional questions. And sometimes those questions are answered well and you get kind of effective governance, and sometimes they're not uh, uh, answered well. But each one of those subsystems has kind of one nucleus, one functional question uh, to uh, address. And if that's the way we think about international order, as kind of this ball of subsystems connecting to each other, then maybe it is that change isn't so much linked to a hegemon uh, and whether there is a new hegemon or not, but rather the conditions specific to that particular subsystem. Uh, and so just to you know, make this more concrete. Uh, the book spends, you know, two thirds of the book uh, looking at the last history of oil, uh, last century of the history of oil politics, and focusing on two subsystems. Uh, one is the oil production uh, uh, subsystem, which is fundamentally about, you know, how much oil do we produce and where do we produce it? Uh, and Bob's company is, is, uh, is a part of that uh, as well. And so are actors like OPEC and all Saudi Arabia, Saudi Aramco, et cetera, all of these different actors that um, 
uh, play a role in it. And that's the one that I think occupies much of our attention, and rightly so, because it affects oil prices on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and so that's probably the one subsystem people immediately go to. And yet there is a second really crucial subsystem, which is about the question about how are oil fields distributed politically around the world? Uh, and that's a question that wars get fought over, right? So most clearly demonstrated, I think, in 1990, when you have Iraq invading Kuwait uh, and starting to move towards Saudi oil fields. Uh, and uh, the US and the UK starting to think, wow, are we going to put up with this? Is this something that we can withstand? And the answer very quickly became no, this is not acceptable to have a quasi-monopolist in the hands of Saddam Hussein. Uh, and so there was a war to push back on that. And so that question is so important that wars get fought over it, which is why it's kind of the second really key subsystem. In that second subsystem, there are kind of a network of arrangements, uh, which I call, uh, not, not just me, oil for security deals. Uh, I shouldn't uh, say that it's my term because it's not. But these are arrangements where an external protector, today mostly the United States, but previously the United Kingdom uh, played this role of, of military protector of oil producing territories. Um, I, uh, and in exchange, the protector gets some sort of oil related economic benefits. It used to be the actual oil, now it's a, a, a different set of benefits, um, but there's, uh, there's a, a basic deal. Uh, and those, some of those deals have broken down over time, but many of them, including the one, say, between U.S. and Saudi Arabia, dates back to 1945-ish, uh, maybe plus or minus, depending on how you read the history. Uh, and with Kuwait and Qatar and UAE, these are long-standing arrangements that survived even the great transition, or one of the great transitions of the 20th century, which was decolonization. Uh, the end of the British Empire, uh, most importantly for the Middle East, but, but European empires uh, more broadly. Um, and to my mind, decolonization is, is, it plays a central role in the history I tell here because it has such an, uh, an interesting consequence for these two subsystems. One of them changes quite dramatically. Decolonization upends that uh, the, the Seven Sisters cartel, which used to cooperate very effectively. Now the cartel uh, was essentially broken up and we have a different set of actors trying to constrain the price of oil uh, or, or the supply of oil. They don't do it nearly as effectively. OPEC is nowhere close to as effective as, effective as the Seven Sisters uh, was. And in fact, they don't cooperate well at all in, in OPEC. Um, and so it really changed that subsystem quite dramatically, decolonization of that is. Whereas decolonization, I think, was mostly left intact, those oil for security deals. It might have shifted the protector from the UK to the US, but that was a relatively superficial change. Uh, and these types of deals uh, persisted in today, uh, including most recently in 2017, we saw some evidence of it too, where you have Secretary of State uh, Rex Tillerson getting on the phone and telling the Saudis not to invade Qatar, where the US has an, a major military base, right? And so the Saudis don't. Um, okay, so stepping back from oil, the, one of the, the lessons, I think, from this history is to look at order and not see just one single thing, but instead to see in the terms of subsystems. And that allows us to see variation, where some are changing and some are not, rather than trying to find the one big change just after big wars or what have you. And that brings us back, I think, to that central question of, of how and when does international order change? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna end here. Uh, I develop a theory uh, around this. I'm not gonna have time to, to, to get into it uh, here, but it depends on kind of two key variables, which are sort of carrots and sticks in the, in the lingo. The, the actual book I use the terms strategic benefits and punishments for non-compliance. And it's that second one, punishments for non-compliance, that I think I really wanna call attention to. Some of my IR scholar uh, colleagues have paid less attention to that historically. And we are seeing, I think, a really vivid demonstration of it, unfortunately, right now, where you have 
uh, Russia as a non-compliant actor with an international order, and the US and the EU trying to respond to Russia's war with a series of punishments, right? Economic punishments, uh, I hope it stays economic and doesn't go more than that. Uh, uh, and the end result of that uh, is uncertain. Uh, and in particular, this what, what makes the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict so difficult, of course, is that unlike many other instances where strong actors punish uh, the, the non-compliant actors, Russia is not, it's not North Korea, it's not Iran, this is a superpower. And so the end result here is very uncertain and the degree to which any sort of punishment can be applied effectively is really uncertain uh, on that. And so we might see a significant change in uh, the subsystem involving national sovereignty or the regional security balance uh, in Europe um, and, and a sort of a breakdown of existing order. So this is my last slide. Um, I will just say I'm happy to talk more about um, um, Ukraine if, if people are interested, but the point of this book is to help us remember that international governing arrangements only work under some conditions, and so we should learn about what those conditions are. And the strategy, intellectually, is to move from the particular, the history of oil, to the general, the IR theory, and then back again to other issue areas that we might care a lot about, in particular, the one I haven't mentioned at all uh, yet, which is climate change, uh, which is uh, a, a real focus of mine uh, and which chapter seven in the book is entirely devoted to. So that's the, the gist of the book. Thank you so much uh, for listening and uh, look forward to hearing um, what Elizabeth and Bob uh, talked about. I just have this. I don't know whether I can leave that up or not, but if we wanted to talk about uh, war in Ukraine, maybe I'll come back to that uh, if, we, if, if we get there. Uh, so thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Elizabeth Saunders now um, to get her take on what we can learn from Jeff's book and, and how uh, she would apply some of the concepts in her own work. Thanks. Elizabeth, over to you. Thanks. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, you're good. Great. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. It's really, um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but it's really a joy to be virtually at least back at the Wilson Center. Um, Jeff and I had many conversations about this um, over over lunch and um, since then. And, you know, so it's really just um, great to be here. Um, I assume I can't see you all anymore, but I assume that's everything's still okay. Yes, you are still on. Thank you. Keep okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing a different screen, but that's okay. Um, so I think, you know, it's just incredible, even in, even when we were talking a couple of weeks ago about the planning for this event, I don't know that we ever could have imagined that the, we would be um, having this event on the morning after, not only in the middle of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but the morning after a an attack on a nuclear power plant um, in Ukraine. And it, it's just, it's one of those moments where you really, you grasp for something to try to help you make sense of it. And I, it, this book is just really, um, it's, a, it's a really striking for a number of reasons. And I, I, I would say from my perspective as an IR scholar, it's so helpful to understand the moments of change that are not at our fingertips. So my high school um, diplomatic history uh, teacher used to, used to talk about dates to hang your hat on. And, and her particular favorite was 1848, um, a date to hang your hat on. And, and we love to hang our hats on dates, right? That's what we, we, we do. We teach our students about them. We talk about the long piece that started in 1945, um, for example, and, and 1973 is really not one that we teach. And I, I'm a security person. I, I teach um, guns and bombs and I don't teach 1973. And this book has really shown me that that's a big hole in my um, knowledge and, and also the way I t t teach my students about continuity and change and the origins of military conflict. So that alone is a huge contribution and why this book will stay 
um, not just on the shelf, but one of those books that you pull off the shelf and is sort of always on the in the pile of um, academic books that are just always on a messy, a, 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 an academic's messy desk, or at least this academic's messy desk, which is a sign that they're really useful. The ones that stay on the shelf forever are the ones that are less useful, I find. Um, and I also um, have to say that as a scholar who has studied the importance of leaders in international relations, I really liked um, the theoretical move that Jeff makes to treat leaders selection and the imposition of a new leader by outside powers um, as part of a way of, of imposing or maintaining international order. There's been a, a tremendous amount of excellent work on regime change. Um, it's its costs, how hard it is to do, the conditions under which um, states try to do it. Um, I know Rob Litvak has written on this. Um, my former colleague, Alexander Downs, has a great book that one would have liked uh, Vladimir Putin to have read before he launched this war about how regime change is um, so, so hard to pull off and he calls it catastrophic success. But here we have this idea in Jeff's book that le putting in leaders is, is a tool for a very particular purpose under some conditions. And, and um, I found that very helpful to think about, you know, under what conditions do we really care about who rules? And it's this very particular idea that the distribution of oil fields has to be, um, uh, it can't be concentrated in, in, in too many ways. Uh, or too many places, and that that really requires um, uh, those who want to put the keep the order going to impose leadership selection. Um, it did make me wonder about the end of the 1991 Gulf War, which I have looked at um, in some unrelated or work that's not related to oil, but um, I have looked at that case and and you know, there was no imposition of a new leader in that case, although I guess the the reversal of the invasion of Kuwait maybe fits Jeff's story very well, but um, it is it is remarkable how the end of that war was very consciously not a regime change. And the George H.W. Bush administration really went to some lengths to avoid that. Um, and I think that's that's notable. Um, but I, I think just in general, this book goes a long way toward explaining U.S. policy in the Middle East after 1973. And it's not as simplistic as the sort of chance of no blood for oil, but it helps kind of resolve this paradox of OPEC as a kind of faux cartel um, and the very real security investments that the United States has made and the continuity of those investments um, since 1973. And maybe it's just because I've been sort of in the weeds of documents in from the Korean War and the Vietnam War, but especially the Korean War lately. Um, I think an, another sort of element of this story is that we think of the post-1945 order or the order between 1945 and 1991 as one big continuous order whose ultimate backstop was nuclear weapons. Right, that we we really um, this is what John Gaddis famously called the long piece, and this um, this book and the events that we've been witnessing on our TV screens has made me, you know, it made me think. Well, gosh, in the Korean War, no one had figured these arrangements out yet. I mean, we had NATO, but it, it but it wasn't the whole idea of how we fight without going nuclear and the concepts of limited war, there was a lot of improvisation going on on the battlefield, in the White House, uh, in diplomatic meetings um, taking place all over the world um, and especially in Europe. The things we kind of take for granted about the, the, the order um, or the, the international security architecture to, to in or, since I've got to catch myself now and not talk about the one true order, but all the subsystems, but the subsystem of managing um, military conflict and keeping it from going nuclear, that was all being kind of sorted out. And it makes me, I don't know if grateful is the right word, but 
um, the Seven Sisters being in control of oil prices and keeping them from fluctuating at all in the 1950s and 60s, you know, one wonders if decolonization had happened more quickly, that could have been a real, I mean, that gets into Rob's dual threat of, um, you know, energy and um, nuclear at the same time. So I, I think that there's a book to be written about the pre 19 73 stability or a story to be told about that we didn't have to worry about the fluctuations. And obviously that came with other many other costs domestically in the countries where, where you know the seven sisters operated. But I think it's it's the long piece um, divided by two, maybe. Um, and so I, I think that's a very interesting thing to think about. And I'll just close with um, some thoughts about the future and climate change, um, because I think Jeff really um, gives us a good launching point for trying to think about like what order would we try to build or what subsystem, subsystem would we try to govern um, in order to do climate change, which is a problem in order to manage or mitigate climate change, to do um, uh, climate mitigation. And we've had so much ink spilled on this in international relations. And we've talked about top down solutions and bottom up solutions and regional solutions and global solutions. And, you know, it can seem sort of hopeless. And uh, when, whenever I teach it, I start to feel pretty depressed about it. And I think one of the things that's really valuable about Jeff's work is that it's so realist, so realist in the sense of being realistic about what it would take to do real climate action. And one of his recent publications that isn't this book, um, a journal article, International Organization, makes the point that you just have to think about this in terms of assets and their value. And, you know, we have to be honest about the value of assets and what climate change is doing to those, those values, right? So he writes climate policy, he, he and co-authors write, Climate politics can be understood as a contest between owners of assets that accelerate climate change like fossil fuel plants and owners of assets vulnerable to climate change such as coastal property. Um, and as we think about the reaction to the war in Ukraine as Europe maybe re-embraces nuclear power and yet we've now seen the effects of you know, nuclear plants in war zones, um, what these assets are worth and, and their exposure to risk, these are just very critical basic questions. And Jeff's answer to some of this in the book is to talk about um, making sure that, the, that the, there's a climate club and it's valuable to be a member of it. And there's some economic penalty or some kind of punishment for being outside it. That's his core idea, I think, in the climate change chapter. Um, so you want to have a club that's valuable to those who are in it and costly to those who are not. And he argues, um, and I'm quoting here, um, that, and this is page 204 for anyone who wants to find it in the book, um, that building a political coalition for a large initial climate club is vital for cooperation. So basically you gotta have buy-in from a big chunk of the world um, resting on a good domestic political foundation in those initial club members. And to me, that's the rub, right? Like, how do we do that? And there's there's been a lot of um, ink, some of it Jeff's own, uh, writing about this um, spilled on the question of how do you build domestic coalitions for international cooperation, uh, mistrust of institutions, polarization, inequality, lots of existing fissures. So we know that this is a hard problem, and I know Jeff knows this is a hard problem, but what I'd love to hear more about is how the war in Ukraine might change this, because we've already seen a complete 180 in German security policy over the course of a weekend. So it does seem as though this is a moment where there are things, there, there's a fork in the road, and we could go down a path that leads to this kind of climate club, but what would it take? Um, if China's gonna be inside this club, which Jeff recommends, what does US policy that's been quite confrontational toward China, how do we build a domestic coalition for being in a club with China? The last time we did that, it was the WTO. And I think, you know, there's people who would make the argument that that's 
that has been weaponized um, as a um, political force, right? So it's gonna be hard to make that case if we're being realistic about winners and losers and what the costs are um, to, 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 in terms of public opinion. Um, on a positive note, I, and this I'll make this my last um, point, the concentration of oil fields and preventing the concentration in the hands of any one actor which sometimes leads to regime, you know, leader change or leader selection, targeted leader change. Um, that to me was maybe a, mo a note of a point of optimism. And I'd love to hear Jeff's thoughts on this um, because if you think about how we go about achieving um, climate mitigation, I wondered if the concentration of climate technology being not that concentrated or, or not that proprietary. Again, this is ter terrain I'm very far off from my own area of expertise, but it strikes me that it's not the same thing as an oil field. And so maybe the costs of regime change and even the benefits of, of or sorry, of leader selection, the costs have been going up and up and up. And I think you're seeing Russia's encountering that, right? The costs of changing the leader in Ukraine is been a lot higher than, than Putin expected, but also the benefits or the necessity of, of controlling, you know, of who rules might be going down in term when we think of, you know, reducing consumption of fossil fuels and also um, who controls climate um, mitigating technology or renewable fuels. So, I mean, it, it, it's not guaranteed that we could have weaponized interdependence over these, these technologies one can easily imagine, but I, I'd love to hear from both Jeff and from Bob, um, whether shifting away from a model where it really there's a finite number of oil fields and we gotta make sure they're distributed across countries and controlled by different leaders. And sometimes we need to impose leader change to a world where that's no longer the case might actually make things a little bit easier. Um, internationally. And as an IR scholar with a pretty depressing outlook on life, I always look for ways in which international relations might get easier. So on that note, I will say this is a really important contribution and it's coming out at a moment where we really need it. So kudos to Jeff for writing an excellent book that um, is going to change the way I do scholarship and how I teach. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I think you gave us a lot to think about and Jeff to respond to. Um, before we touch on some of your really great questions, though, I want to turn to uh, to Bob. Um, as a former senior DOD official, I think it would be really interesting to hear your reactions to uh, some of the points that Jeff makes in his book about the oil for security. And then later, we will no doubt have some questions from the BP perspective. <laughs> Thanks, Absolutely. Uh, although, to be clear, I do not stand here or sit here representing BP. Um, <laughs> this is important for my future employment. Um, look, I, I sort of struggle with where to start because it's, it's really a great book for a wide audience, and, and I really enjoyed it and really read it. And, and to be clear, I rarely spend my downtime reading international relations theory books. So this is sort of a break for me, if you will. Um, and it's also a welcome break from my day job, which is currently dominated by the world of energy markets, sanctions, and other ramifications of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, so look, the, the like political science nerd in me that, that pops up every once in a while wants to really dive into subsystems, but with Jeff and Elizabeth here, I, I'm, I'm not going to, because that, that seems wrong. But I do think what I really liked about it, it was very useful for describing what happens, at least in my view, for a more reliable and granular way, granular way than most I theory, IR theory I remember. Um, and I think in the idea that in combination of subsystems, it gives us a better sense of whatever that quote international order is is really helpful because we spent a lot of time in the government talking about maintaining the international order and really not knowing, admitting even in private moments, we didn't know what that meant, but we were pretty sure we knew it when we saw it. Um, but this I think really is helpful for me thinking through it. And I actually think the examination of benefits and punishments, if you will, uh, was a really good opportunity to kind of think through that. Um, and believe it or not in the Defense Department, we think more about often the the joint benefits or the combined benefits than even the punishments to some extent. Um, but I'm pretty sure I'm not here for that. 
Uh, so I'm not going to go very much into it, as I, I like to joke. Most of what I remember getting out of my international relations, my, the, the most recent international relations course, which I took a long time ago, was checking when the seasons changed by when Bob Jervis changed from his solid color turtleneck to solid color polo. And, and I don't know, I even went on the web and, and saw and, and his like official photo and you know, the, 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 great, the late great had like one of those solid color turtlenecks. I'm like, yep, that's him. Like he wore like three colors and then three colors and polos. And, and that, that was it. Like, I mean, I saw him every week. And, anyway. um, but I, I, so I will talk a little bit about the oil and security part of the book, hopefully leaves a lot of time for questions and answers. Um, I did spend a, a career in the national security field, most of it in the Department of Defense. But I do really want to applaud a couple of things off the bat and encourage more people to buy and read the book. Um, look, I love what I see is what I saw as the basic assumption of this work, which is the world end up, ends up being a lot more complicated than IR theory generally likes to admit. Um, and look, I, you know, when you, when you kind of live it, that you, you like when that happens. Um, I accept the general idea that if all you do is just describe history and don't draw any lessons from it, it's not all that useful. Being a history major in undergrad, I still like that idea, but I do think that Jeff has done a great job of really centering and, and rooting this in, in reality much more than others, I think, as, uh, as Elizabeth also said. I also can't help but say that I'm a, a fan of the subtle, or maybe in the academic world it was less than subtle, dig at theories that really spend a lot of time studying what is easily measurable versus what is actually important. Um, and I think that came out in the climate piece in terms of the bilateral investment treaties. And, and I thought that was, um, yes, for the sake of measurability, we'll look at something that doesn't really matter. Um, so I, I appreciated that. Um, and look, any theory that is able to admit and tackle the complexity of the real world in which we live and still manage to come up with some useful structure for understanding that world is incredibly useful. So I, I really do thank you. Um, secondly, a great job of describing the oil system, uh, the events, the history. Um, I, BP was one of the seven sisters when we, when we had that term. Now I guess we go with super majors, but... Uh, um, we're a little less major now than we were before after uh, exiting from our Rosneft uh, 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 stock shareholding. Um, and, and, you know, really it's an important piece and important for, uh, for how we think about defense strategy, national security, international affairs for years. This, the oil for security idea is all of us in government sort of inherently understand, if not directly admit. Um, uh, we don't always like to think about it quite that, that transactionally, but on the other hand, yeah. Hard, hard to argue. Um, there's a great quote in here. I'll pull out later. If I like, yep, that makes sense. Um, I buy that. Third, I think um, what's really impressive is trying to use this theory to tackle what is clearly one of the most vexing and impactful problems we face, which is climate change. Um, and, and you know, we can't ignore the fact that we're rapidly running out of the limited carbon budget that we have to keep this a livable planet. So if you can ever take anything and have that theory help us understand maybe a way to get through that, Good on you. Um, uh, I'm not as hopeful uh, about this since I, uh, since one of the premises is uh, the domestic population within every, any country has to be there and has to want to get there. And uh, I think, you know, we've seen that uh, U.S. Poli well, any politicians are very good at sort of near-term local issues and figuring out how to solve those and really bad at long-term global issues. Um, it just doesn't fit within the structure very well. There are notable exceptions of people who try to get at this, um, but it's difficult to, to sort of get the, the overall American polity and, frankly, many other countries' polities to get through this. Um, but, so, you know, and I think, frankly, the last thing is, you know, as Jeff said, I, I think all of us look at this, especially when, when in the government, as recognizing that um, there is no one global hegemon. Right, that that is not how the world is really structured right now. Maybe there were moments, but it's not the case now. We have to continually work with how does the U.S. play a role in trying to lead, protect the international order, again, in quotes, while recognizing that other countries have a huge economic stakes with many other countries that we might consider adversaries or enemies. Um, so this idea of how do you work within a partial hegemony system is something that, that was very appealing. But... So from a national per per security perspective, I just want to note a couple of things, and I think then we can get it.
under discussion. Um, first, I think most of us in the national security field are practitioners. Again, the overall idea that the Middle East is critical for us because someone, and that someone for past many decades has meant the United States, has to ensure that the world has access to oil that comes from that region. It's frankly a given. Um, sadly, in many cases, that's also where the analysis stopped. Um, okay, sea lines communications, which of course in the Pentagon we then, it's an acronym, it's a SLOC. And we have to protect the SLOCs so that the world can continue to get oil and, you know, from the Middle East. Do we got it? Good. Check. What's our next issue? Um, no, but I think, you know, it's not the only interest we have, but it is one that no one can deny is a large interest. And reading this book really made me think about it. Like, why did we run to the defense of Kuwait and Saudi Arabia? If we assume that someone's going to produce oil no matter what, that it's in their interest to produce oil, why do we go to their defense? Why, you know, was it oil? Of course it was oil. I think everybody in the government, I am not that old that I was in the government at this time, um, would have said absolutely it's about international order, it's about the respecting of borders, but of course it was about oil too. And I think, you know, we can't kind of pull that away from it. But it did make me wonder, which of course is the sign of any good book, is, well, why Kuwait and not other countries, right? So when you think about that, you're like, well, I guess oil really, you know, like, I care less about the territorial integrity of, of states that aren't important. And that's, you know, uh, you, you got to kind of come to that. Um, so again, I think most people would say we stood up for Kuwait, et cetera, but I think in the, you know, the, the better explanatory nature of this is, is oil um, and the energy, you know, sector writ large. Um, I think it's worth noting that when in the government, as I said, we talk a lot about the international order and our role in maintaining it or not. Um, and so I think, again, this is really helpful to understand that there is no one order, what's useful about it, and frankly, focusing on the subsystems that are the most important ones that are a piece of this, the ones that we, you know, there's some that you really don't care about, you know, I don't know, it's poaching, you know, poaching of tusks of African elephants versus, you know, oil systems. So it's good to kind of think through that. Um, Third, as I said, I think in the government, we tend to think more about the benefits than even the punishments, even in the Department of Defense. Um, and frankly, I think we probably put a little bit too much weight on how important the benefits are um, and how useful the punishments are um, in some cases. So um, I think this is, it was very good to kind of think about this. We really like to think about the international order as um, something that everyone benefits from and, and um, that's why people are a part of it. And if you didn't benefit from it, why would you be a part of it? And then obviously to, to take out the punishment piece of that structure is uh, perhaps wishful thinking to a large extent. Um, but I will say sort of, uh, you know, for fourth in this is the centerpiece of our thinking is almost always what is in our national interests. And frankly, we always expect that in the U.S. we're going to operate in what's in our national interests. And we expect every other country to do it too. Um, I always used to say I was very, I always got very concerned when someone said, well, they're only doing that because it's in their interest. I was like, I would, I would be concerned if they weren't. Um, what does that mean? Well, they're only doing it because of the money we give. Well, if somebody gives more money, then I guess they're going to win that argument, right? So, so the idea that our centerpiece is around national interests always was forefront in our mind, and again, not surprisingly. But I do think most U.S. government people come to the table thinking that maintaining the international order is in our interests, that we benefit from it more than anybody else, and therefore it's worth it for some of the costs, and some of the costs are maintaining the ability for punishment, clearly, um, to do this. Um, and, and frankly, it's just, it was always the, the secret we never liked to tell because it didn't seem seemly to go to people and say, you know we're benefiting from this system more than you guys are, right? Because we figured they knew it. And, you know, but they were okay because a rising tide lifts all boats, not to be overly, you know, the cliche. But um, so this kind of a concept was very interesting to kind of think through in the, of where, how U.S. government folks, I think, in general tend to think. Um, and then finally, and I, I'm somewhat sorry to end on this, um, we in the government, uh, I hate to tell you, we, we don't think about IR systems or theories um, uh, when we're doing these uh, things or making decisions or presenting policy. We know. Okay. <laughs> Good. I mean, I mean, there was a little bit of talk about deterrence theory for a while and the spiral theory of deterrence and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But, um, but I will say it's, it's not to say or imply that, that the principles are not in our minds as we're thinking about them. 
but we're rarely doing it consciously. But we I know that too. That's yeah, okay. why we bought <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to give you something here, you know. Um, but I do think what's interesting, it means it's the time to make an impact on how policymakers and decision makers think is actually before the crisis and to try to build that into the way people are thinking about things and it will sort of, it'll emerge, but at no point to go, oh, you know, I remember now about the subsystems. That makes total sense, given the subsystem we're talking in. Um, that would not work in the sit room. Uh, no, not at all. So, look, I'm a big fan of this work. Uh, big, I thank Jeff for doing it. it I think really great. Uh, over drinks, I found many things that I would love to discuss slash quibble with, um, but that's what makes it interesting, right? I mean, the big thing that I always come back to is that I, it's every time I've seen a major decision being made, it has more than one reason for why it's taken. There may be a dominant one, there may be a different one for different people, but sort of figuring out how we get around that to me is something that I think would be interesting to discuss, but again, probably over drinks. And also a significant role for the individuals in his or her experience. And I think you can, um, the, the second, the invasion of Iraq is sort of another piece where I think it's interesting to kind of play this against it since it didn't seem to be about oil as much, although how can it not be about oil? BP is, of course, now in Iraq, producing out of the third largest oil field in the world. So, um, you know, uh, but they're fun to discuss. Any book that makes me want to delve into these issues and IR theory is absolutely worth reading. So again, I thank you, Jeff, for this. Um, and I look forward to talking about some of the, these issues or some of the more, quote, practical issues that are going on with my life when I return to my computer and I think about sanctions policy. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, Jeff, I'm going to turn it back to you to see if there's anything that you wanted to respond to in Elizabeth and, and Bob's uh, comments. I will say that there are a number of questions that have come in, and I'm sure there are some here in the room, and I know I have a couple, um, but why don't you take a minute to, to respond real quick? Yeah, thank you so much, Bob and Elizabeth, uh, for these great comments uh, and for the very kind words. So I appreciate it. Uh, I won't try to respond uh, to everything. I won't uh, won't be able to, but I'll pick up just a couple of uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, one uh, from Elizabeth about you know a climate club and how to think about getting that domestic support uh, for a, a, a climate club and carbon tariffs specifically, right? So the idea of a climate club is to have a set of countries that have a common tariff wall around them um, so that there's uh, the, the countries that are inside the club are doing you know, some form of carbon tax or pro-climate policy generally that raises the cost of manufacturing things. Um, and therefore need a tariff uh, at the border to protect them from um, manufacturers outside of that jurisdiction that might be able to produce at a, a cheaper level. And um, I think in terms of why that is so important to me is that uh, it is precisely to use foreign policy as a way of rallying the domestic politics uh, or, or trying to solve the domestic politics uh, problem because when we go back to the Kyoto Protocol and why it failed with a 95 to 0 vote uh, in the Senate, right, so 95 to 0, the Senate doesn't agree much on anything that, at that level and they voted no to the Kyoto Protocol 95 to 0 and the reason, the very explicit reason was we don't want you know, the U.S. economy to be at a competitive disadvantage against China and the global south that are not going to have to abide by these rules. And so, and that problem has always been kind of core to the kind of anti-climate uh, anti um, uh, policy uh, uh, side of the house or side of the discussion. And so my view on that is, is we can use carbon tariffs to help alleviate that concern, right? Was to say, well, look, this is not gonna be a competitive disadvantage because we're gonna use carbon tariffs to try to solve that. And that's, you know, how do we get domestic support for carbon, uh, for, for climate policy? It's a hard problem as, as Elizabeth says, and I don't have all the answers, but I think that the foreign policy element here can be part of, uh, if not generating domestic support, at least, uh, defanging some of the opposition uh, to it, right? So that's the, uh, the thinking about this. And I'm pleased to see, actually, just in the last couple of days, I saw some headlines about how Republican uh, um, lawmakers are uh, 
showing increased support for carbon tariffs. Uh, so there's actually some movement on that just this week uh, and connected to the Ukraine crisis uh, as well. Uh, Maybe uh, I'll just say one thing about Bob's uh, uh, comment, then I'll, I'll stop. But just uh, I'd love to hear, over a beer or otherwise, uh, more of the quibbles uh, about it. But I, I'm, I'm very gratified to hear your comment about how inside the U.S. government, you know, often you know policymakers such as yourself, when you were there, um, had that tendency to overestimate the benefits of international order. And to me, that was one of the really striking lessons that I kept seeing, especially when I was doing the sort of the British history of this, where they kept thinking that they were, you know, we're running the British Empire and this is, this is good for everybody. And then they were shocked to discover that, in fact, many people were not all that keen on the British Empire. And that is something that I think Americans should take very seriously, that this is something that we are likely to be blind about, uh, given that the U.S. has been sort of running an order for a while now, uh, or multiple orders, if you uh, use my terminology. Um, we should be quite conscious of the fact that things that look like they're, you know, cooperative and everybody benefits, some of those actors are really only doing it because they feel like they don't have much of a choice. Uh, and when uh, things start to go sideways, that's gonna come to the fore in a way that will, is likely to surprise us. So uh, thank you for that, that comment. I'll stop, thanks a lot. Thanks, Jeff. I think, so there's been a few questions that have, have come in and, and there's one in the room. So I'm actually gonna go to the room first and then the questions that have come in, a lot of them are around sort of the climate change, um, energy transition, thinking about, you know, so if it's not oil, then it's critical minerals that are going to be necessary for the energy transition. Um, and I would also note um, Elizabeth made a point about climate technologies and even thinking about, you know, things like solar radiation management or climate capture. Like, all of those have, are going to have impacts, right? Um, and don't have sort of strong governing arrangements right now. And so thinking about that. So I'm just plugging that for my future question. But first we'll go to Jeremy in the room. Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, hi, I'm Jeremy Wallace, um, professor at Cornell at uh, Georgetown's uh, Mortara Center for the Year. Um, so thank you, Jeff, uh, for sharing this. This is great. I have kind of two broad questions, again, over drinks. I, um, no quibbles yet, but interesting, uh, but love to hear details. And, um, but the two broad questions, one kind of more historical and one kind of more future-oriented. Um, how was... 1973, kind of the um, the kind of like the break. How was that structured by global bipolarity? To what extent, particularly on the leader question that that Elizabeth kind of like puts forward, to what extent did leaders feel, or the leaders kind of of those countries feel like they were protected by the fact that there was the Cold War going on? Obviously, you didn't run a like separate counterfactual history to see what happened, but. Was there, is there anything in the documentary evidence or in the chapters that kind of you can use to try to think about global bipolar? Did that matter or is that kind of me just trying to reimpose IR structure on, on what is actually a more complicated, um, the, the reality? The second um, is kind of more future oriented, um, kind of about climate club, but kind of maybe pulling back to a little at the theoretical level. Like how do we think about the fading of or creation of new subsystems like in, into this international order, um, because it's if thinking about like the subsystem is kind of a relatively abstract term, but if you think about it, I was thinking about it in machinery terms. Like if if it's all gears and they all kind of work together to a greater or lesser extent, pulling out one of them could be totally insignificant, or the whole machine could crash. Um, and so, how do you think about? Um, subsystems and the kind of their interlocking nature or and are there is there are there stories about fading of these systems or creation of new ones that you think can can help us think about what a new climate club might mean or uh, something like that um, but yeah. thanks Jeremy um, and then actually if you could pass the mic just one down I'll take one more question in the room um, and then I'm going to weave in some on, from online and just make it a tight package for you, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> nice. 
Yeah. Please go ahead and introduce yes, yourself. Yes, I'm Miles Kaler. Uh, it was my pleasure to be at the Wilson Center exactly at the same time as Elizabeth and Jeff. And so for those of you who don't know the Wilson Center, uh, it's not only an excellent place to spend a year doing research, but also you get to meet a lot of really brilliant scholars who you maintain contact with through your career. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a real pleasure. And Jeff was working on another excellent book. He had a slide on the Petrostate's book. I'm sure you're horrified to find your predictions in the Petrostate book <laughs> verified today, uh, Jeff, in the way that it's being, but uh, I just wanted to point that out as well. But anyway, um, this book as well, I think, is going to have a big impact. But I had... Um, one particular question, which is about the punishment side of this, and who provides the punishments? It seems to me in international relations theory, there's always been a question. Um, I think Bob Axelrod and other people have pointed this out there. Those who are playing the game, and then there are those who kind of maintain the structure uh, that keeps the game going. And you, you point to the United States, obviously, as a figure that has done this over time. But it's costly. Um, and the question is, when the cost when when the politics underlying this role start to come apart, as they have in the United States, yeah. uh, how do you maintain that role going forward? I mean, uh, Mr. Scher pointed out the U.S. has benefited from this. The elite view has always been that the United States benefit from this role, and the role of punishing is not that great most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but we have had a former president who clearly takes a very different view, which is the United States is not that role. The United States should be behaving like other countries who free ride on us, as many of them are doing during the current crisis, for example. So I, I guess I'm guessing, getting at the question of kind of the domestic policy, policy politics of the punisher <laughs> with, when the punishment becomes very costly. And, and it's a small point. I noticed you don't mention the Iraq war in the book. Not the first Iraq war, but the Iraq war of, uh, of uh, the first decade of this uh, century, which to my mind had a big effect on the American public's view of what role we want to play and how big a role we want to play in this kind of maintenance of order, either at the subsystemic or the systemic level. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to let you take those, Jeff, the, the question about um, sort of global, was it bipolarity? <laughs> Um, and the thinking about uh, phasing out subsystems and creation of new subsystems, and then the question um, about who provides the punishment and how does that, how might that come apart yeah. as the politics change? Great questions. Uh, I, I should have expected very uh, smart questions uh, from given the, the, the crowd. So um, Jeremy's question, I'll start with the, the easiest one first, I think, uh, uh, or at least the easiest for me to, to think about, is that in terms of fading of subsystems, um, I worry much less about those as I do of creation of new subsystems because generally the subsystems are, are they revolve around problems, right? And so, um, you know, there was a time when we worried a lot about, um, uh, about whale hunting and about, you know, the, getting oil from whales and we don't worry about that so much. It's kind of a subsystem that's faded and that's kind of lovely, right? Uh, it's, we still have problems with whales, but it's not, it's not uh, a, a serious uh, you know, top level, top tier international affairs issue. Uh, whereas climate change did, wasn't, you know, wasn't a problem until 50 years ago, and, uh, and, and now it's more and more a problem every day. And we have this closing window that Lauren referred to um, uh, earlier. And so it's the really, it's the rise of the subsystems that uh, uh, are the, the issue, but but I want to draw the distinction between. So I think of subsystems is kind of like the uh, the substrata on which governance can form or not form, right? And so usually the problem emerges, and then the there's some lag between the problem emerging and the governance responding to it. Uh, and with climate change, because the governance is so tr tricky that it is famously called the super wicked problem uh, because it's so hard. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's going to be a big lag, maybe, um, uh, well, we won't go do, down that path, but how, how consequential that lag might be. Um, uh, in terms of bipolarity in the 70s, so yes, it's, the Cold War certainly mattered. I mean, it, it always mattered in, in global affairs. But in oil, um, you know, the Soviet Union was largely sort of self-sufficient in oil and, um, I don't want to say that it didn't play any role in the rest of the world's oil market, but 
uh, it was a much smaller factor, and it, you know, in the 80s it became a significant exporter, uh, and that was a, a huge source of, of revenue to, uh, to them. But it, 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 the the rest of the world's oil system was largely a kind of Anglo-American run system, uh, and so uh, it, it was less consequential for what was happening in the 70s. Um, there were, were, of course, you know, Iraq and Iran were both thinking about well. You know, if we move away from American protection, should we, should we, or do we have to move into a Soviet sphere, and can we stay out of it, and all of that uh, stuff? But those were, I think, sort of secondary uh, concerns. Miles' question is a really good one about who provides the punishment, and uh, it's a tricky one. I mean, the the Iraq 2003 war. Maybe I should have talked uh, a bit more in in this book. Uh, I did write about it in a in a previous article, and I I think of it as. Uh, to answer maybe Bob's point on this, that I, I do think of it as oil set the whole political context for that war, but it wasn't an oil war uh, in the sense that it's, you know, many people often, the, the sort of left-wing critics would say, like, oh, the U.S. was going in to grab the oil, and I just don't think that story holds up well at all to the, the evidence. Uh, and so it wasn't, it wasn't that kind of oil war at all. Um, I think you're right, though, and I, I, you're making me think about how much that war does affect uh, the U.S. ability, U.S. domestic politics of being an enforcer uh, on, on things around the world. That one in Afghanistan, of course, uh, and um, the question of how sustainable it is. In, in the theory that I push out, I don't identify the the. Uh, the powerful actor that is the Punisher, and in theory it can be anyone. It doesn't have to be the U.S. And sometimes, I think in some subsystems, you know, the U.S. is not, is, doesn't play that role. It's somebody else that plays that role. But for many of them, you are exactly right. It is the U.S. And I, you know, it, it's sort of uncharted territory on some level of like when that, that role disappears. Yeah. 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 So just on that, that last one, I think, um, you know, back in the in the early days of the Trump administration, when you know the, the things that we were up in arms about seem now trivial, um, one of the things that a friend of mine and I talked about, who were in the Department of Defense, and then all both left at the same time. Actually, she left a little bit earlier. But the idea of it's clearly a failure of the foreign policy elite, if we choose that term, that we did not, we have not effectively told the American public that the international system that we do spend time and money propping up, being the punisher, actually benefits us more than anybody else, right? And, and if we take nothing else from this victory, uh, of the, that, that we didn't get that point, that that point has not been effectively made, clearly, right? And, and again, to some extent, it's unseemly. You don't want to be a big, you know, you don't want to look at, at tell the American public, hey, don't worry, we're benefiting much more than Germany is, uh, because the Germans hear that. <laughs> um, so I mean, yeah. you 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 know you you try not to, but we sort of took it for granted, and we and it's not to say that you know Trump is the first person to hit on this, right? Um, there have been numerous people who, through you know the past couple of decades, um, everyone likes to go back to George Washington's you no know, no foreign and you know entangling alliances. Recognizing that it's a little bit of a different situation then than it is now, but you also know, he didn't uh, say that. <laughs> It was Jefferson. I always make my students learn that. <laughs> See, but people think he did. <laughs> That's what's more important. <laughs> and also, Jefferson did say it. So. Jefferson did say it. Okay. Um, yeah. Jefferson just wanted different entangling alliances than anyway. Uh, <laughs> what what little I remember from the Broadway show. Anyway, um, so I think that is something that that is just it's hard to do. It's been a failure. We haven't had to do it for a while. I think it's a failure. But also, I think we have to have to be realistic that this was also the uh, Trump, <laughs> a, a, dare I say, a trumped up boogeyman to deal with a lot of other disaffection within the American populace. That actually had nothing to do with this, but it was easy. It was in this first establishment of, a, of an us them that was useful. Nonetheless, there's still a responsibility, I think, to show that the international system works well for us, the American public, as well. Thank you, Bob. Um, a few questions have come in from online. Um, Randy Henning at American University, first, congratulations to you, Jeff, on the book. Um, 
following on Elizabeth's comments, he invites you to expand further on how the theoretical framework applies to the climate to climate change. How are the subsystems? How do they ex or what are the subsystems, and how do they explain outcomes? So maybe just a little bit more specifically about how um, you would think about that in terms of climate change. The and then uh, from, I'm sorry, I'm not going to say your name correctly, Chiara Papalardo, a doctoral candidate at Georgetown University Law Center. The shift towards clean energy technologies such as batteries for EVs and emission-free power seems not necessarily devoid of, uh, or void of uh, potential rivalries, confrontations, trade-offs, since it's based on critical minerals, which like oil deposits are also unevenly distributed. So uh, your views on that. Um, and then somebody asked, uh, in using the language of assets to think about climate change, is this done with a mind to move away from framing it in terms of security? Um, and then there's, uh, sorry, one more. I'm just going to pile on here. <laughs> yeah. uh, Brendan Lawlor from the Office of Congressman Lamb. Does this theory have any implications for domestic renewable energy policy? So maybe thinking about just sort of the climate equation um, in terms of addressing climate change, but then what are the systems that are going to need to be developed um, to support that? There's another question on Ukraine and, and Russia that's actually quite a bit harder, so I'm going to hold off on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's there's lots of questions. Um, just on the last one about domestic uh, renewable energy, I would say, you know, there is a really significant role, I think, for government to play on research and development and on bridge funding to, from getting from IDEA, which American universities and American you know, innovation centers generally are really good at, uh, to the point where Americans are actually manufacturing the goods that we dreamed up uh, on, uh, on the blueprints. And uh, there's a really big gap there. We can see, um, and scholars have shown how you know American ideas end up traveling to Germany or China or both, uh, to, where they generate a lot of jobs and and um, economic activity. And America, I think, needs to get smarter about uh, making you know kind of closing that circuit within the uh, the U.S. economy. Uh, and so there is uh, an important role uh, to play there. Um, on the clean energy transition, uh, are there going to be rivalries uh, around critical minerals, et, et cetera? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, and um, many of the key commodities for the uh, clean energy transition are distributed unevenly, just like uh, oil is. But I, I think that there is a really big difference between um, trans uh, trading energy products themselves, like oil or natural gas, uh, and versus the materials used to build um, wind turbines or solar panels, et cetera, because of a time horizons fact, right? right? So this, the idea of oil and gas trade has to be done kind of continuously, right? And yes, you can stockpile. Uh, and in fact, you know, oil stockpiling played a really important role uh, after 1973. Uh, and uh, should play a larger role in how Europe deals with natural gas, Russian natural gas. They haven't done enough in terms of uh, resilience there. But the, the core problem is if I cut off your natural gas, you're going to be freezing next winter, which is different from if I don't sell you, you know, the minerals for uh, a, a solar plant, you've, you've got a, a longer uh, reaction time to deal with that kind of shortage. And I don't want to minimize this here because I do think that, um, and there's some good thinking uh, at DOD in particular around supply chains and critical minerals and making sure that we have kind of secure suppliers from, you know, relatively friendly countries. Uh, there, there is a political dimension to this that I think um, we are waking up to and uh, many in Washington are starting to pay attention to it. And I think it is the right uh, tra trajectory to go in. Uh, so I hope that particularly countries like Canada and Australia uh, can work with the United States to be kind of um, responsible sourcers, if you will, uh, of those critical uh, minerals. Um, Randy uh, Henning asked me about the, the subsystems in climate change, so I'll just do that one quickly because I know you have uh, uh, other questions to ask. But um, I think about uh, climate change mitigation, at least in terms of four subsystems. One is the actual uh, uh, policies 
uh, that are designed to limit emissions per se, right? So these are sort of carbon taxes and cap and trade and all of uh, the, the various things uh, that go along with that. So that is one important subsystem. There is a second one that relates to how capital that is climate related, particularly fossil fuel capital, uh, should be treated. And so the Europe uh, European Union in particular is leading the way on developing a taxonomy for cap, uh, for for finance about what does what do green bonds mean? What do uh, what does kind of uh, what are reporting standards for corporations? Uh, what are how do we account for carbon emissions? How do we account for climate risks? Uh, what role should central banks have? I mean, so all of this is related to capital uh, and uh, asset valuation on some level. That's a second subsystem. There's a third one around negative emissions technology, uh, which is, you know, how do we um, <clears throat> incentivize the development of new technologies, particularly carbon capture and storage, but we can think of others, ocean-based ones, et cetera, uh, and that might be very different set of actors where it's more venture capital and prizes and that kind of thing that, and, and good old fashioned government R&D that supports uh, and that kind of technologies. And then the fourth one, which is a little bit of a, a, a fudge, but it's the interaction between um, climate change and the trade system. Uh, and so that's where I get to the carbon tariffs. Like, so how should we trade as a world in a, uh, a world where we have uneven climate change policies. We have some countries that are uh, climate leaders and some countries that aren't. And that is, you know, almost inevitably going to be the way the world is, where we're not all adopting the same climate standards in lockstep. There's going to be some variation. And so how should the leaders trade with the laggards? And, and that's where I start to go down the path that I mentioned earlier about why we need carbon tariffs and how important they are to maintaining the domestic political support to actually getting the carbon tax or whatever uh, a, a, in the first place. It, it, the carbon tax won't happen unless we can deal with the, the trade implications uh, of that. So I'll stop there. Uh, I'm not sure I got all of the questions, but at least most of them. No, that was good, Jeff, thank you. Um, I wonder, actually, Elizabeth, can I ask you a question? Um, I think you know you've noticed that you're noted that you're working on a book that argues that elites, um, rather than voters, are the made made audience for foreign policy dis dis decisions and democracies. And in the context of climate change, I think this has some pretty um, important ramifications. I, I wonder if you could take a minute to comment on that. Um, and maybe thinking about how subsystems could be useful in this case, um, as Jeff just laid out. But just thinking about who is um, sort of driving decision making and how climate might change that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and you know, my book is about war and the use of military force. And you know, I had forgotten about the the critical minerals distribution, which is a great counterpoint to my optimism about climate tech. So, you know, there, there goes my attempt to, to have a tiny shred of optimism. But um, leaving that aside, you know, I, when I think about building this domestic coalition, I just come back to China. And I mean, it all comes back to US-China relations on a basic level. But from my perspective, I just don't know politically how separable these subsistence are going to be. Now, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And one extremely striking instance of this is happening right now, which is um, the Iran nuclear deal is still, well, at least as of the last time I checked Twitter, it's still live. And the Russians are apparently being helpful. They were, at least the last time I asked some, an expert in this. Um, so, you know, it, it's certainly possible to have cooperation in some spheres, subsystems, while you're having confrontation in others. On the other hand, up until last week, countering China was the big sort of public facing goal of, you know, the second administration in a row. And so it's just hard. I try to picture the, the like what Jeff says about the climate club makes so much sense 
but the getting from here to there, which is always the rub in politics, right? Like we 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 recognize where we should go, and the getting there turns out to be, you know, the the hard part. How do we, like, I can see a world in which we elites are able to come together and signal that the American economy and the world climate, which includes the American climate that's suffering tremendously these days from the effects of climate change as, as all countries are. But again, this is a sales job for the American public. I could see an elite consensus around the idea that we need to make a new kind of basic bargain with China on trade and all these other things. And that if we do that, we and China, the Chinese will be in the club, which is essentially enough to kind of set the world level of, you know, that's, that's like, um, you know, I don't, I don't have a license to practice IPE, so I don't have the terminology like at hand, but, um, you know, that's a price setter. Like if the U S and China are in the club, then the rest of the world doesn't have a lot of choice. Right. So, so that would be a huge, uh, achievement. But there's a lot of politicians now either invested in or who, who perceive benefits to being hostile towards China. And it's not clear. I mean, I hate to say it, but those are really not the politicians who are going to be reading Jeff's book. So what's in it for those politicians in the Korea? No politicians case, are going to be reading Jeff's book. Yeah. That's to be clear, right? That's not happening. <laughs> Um, so, so I guess, you know, in the, in the case of there, you know, there were a lot of skeptics at the beginning of the cold war, it was not a done deal that we would invest, you know, we, we signed the, and ratified the NATO treaty it was a lift. Um, we, but then the, the rearmament program, I mean, even Harry Truman needed convincing and then he was convinced and there was still a huge divide in the Republican party, which we forget this now, but that's when there was, you know, very much, uh, of. Trump-like kind of faction that, um, you know, it was not clear what direction the Republican Party was going to go. Um, at that time, the Democrats had some divisions too, but they they controlled the presidency and the presidency wanted to go in this direction of rearmament and confrontation. And it just wasn't clear that you'd get an elite consensus. And then the Korean War came along and that generated the elite cons consensus. So, um, and not without further difficulties. I mean, it, it didn't go smoothly um, and, and you had the MacArthur episode and so forth. So I guess my, my question is, how do you get an elite consensus or at least at a minimum prevent the kind of anti-China rhetoric that would blow up sort of a quieter consensus or, or a consensus, enough of a consensus that would allow you to do the thing where you walk and chew gum at the same time, where you can, where you can be competing on the in other spheres, but you know you have this sphere in which you actually are cooperating. And I don't know if you can do that on a distributional issue. Um, but again, I don't have a license to practice IPE, so I leave that part to Jeff. That's great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Jeff or Bob, do you want to chime in on anything? Actually, I'd love to, yeah. to, to just jump on this um, topic of like, you know, uh, I think I think Elizabeth's raising really important questions about, you know, the politics of, of being cooperative with China on anything is is a is a thing. Um, but it, it may be less of an issue uh, in practice. Um, maybe I'm being too optimistic about this, but it, I think that the, the politics of rivalry and even hostility with China are not likely to go away anytime soon. That's just, that's a sort of structural uh, matter of this. But the details of how that hostility is, uh, you know, manifested or what the policy is, for most part, you know, the American public doesn't care uh, and doesn't follow uh, this stuff. And so uh, it's, it's imaginable that you could have, you know, a set of carbon tariff policies. Uh, all, all you really need to do, you don't need to make a big announcement about it. You don't need to make it, a, you don't need to call it a climate club at all. You could just say, we have some carbon tariffs. We're applying them to standard, to, to countries that do not have sufficiently high environmental standards. The US government gets to judge those standards. And, you know, China and, and 
the United States could work out, you know, what they think is a reasonable minimum threshold. Uh, and if China is above that, then the United States doesn't apply its carbon tariff to China. It applies it to other countries that don't meet um, that standard. And so there, there doesn't need to be a, you know, a big climate club summit m meeting or anything like that. The, the president doesn't need to get uh, on a plane and go to Beijing about it. Or there's, there's, there doesn't need to be that. It can be sort of a low level uh, technocratic thing. Um, but I, I, I do think, you know, when we think about climate change and, and US-China politics generally, there's a temptation for most people to think about climate change as an issue area where we want cooperation, and then there's a whole bunch of other issue areas where we want to compete. Uh, and that is, there's some truth to that, right, in terms of, you know, diplomatic agendas. Climate gets a, its own little box, right, or its own time on the agenda. But we should also think about climate change as not just an issue area, but as shifting the whole strategic landscape uh, on lots of other issues, uh, on you know what it means to have um, clean energy transition. Well, some of some countries that want to transition to clean energy might decide to buy Russian nuclear uh, reactors. Right, Russia is far and away the leader in civilian nuclear sales. And so as we see Russia selling its nuclear technology around the world, that creates geopolitical consequences too, right? And this is in some sense being, being driven by climate change or the desire for clean energy transition. And so the, the point I'm trying to make about this is just, is yes, we should think about climate change as an issue area, but also think about it as affecting all the other issue areas uh, as well, that it's the landscape uh, matter. And, and to some extent, that is kind of what makes all of these wicked issues, if you will. It's it's hard. You know, China recently seems to have been made it clear you want to talk to us about climate. That's great, but we're not going to talk to you. We're not going to take that off the table and, and only talk about this. So, um, you know, yeah, we think it's great that uh, you know we we of course all want the the clean energy transition, but we need to develop our own nuclear program so that we can be the only, the only ones who are exporting to suit. So um, it does, it adds to that to that complication. But I, I do have to foot say all of this to me, again, it's my own, I, you know, just where you stand is where you sit. There is a role for governments in this to set the parameters, to set the incentives. Because without that, I can assure you that no private company is going to suddenly do something that, it, that will bankrupt them. Um, and so no private company is going to go ahead and we're going to the transition no matter what. And, you know, BP is, happens to have one of those examples of losing billions of dollars in the solar panel industry because we went too soon. You know, went to 1997, tried to produce them, lost our shirt, billions of dollars just right off. You know, so, and there wasn't the incentive structure. So recognizing the important role for, in all of these things for the government, I think we've had it a couple different times, but... Now my mic's on, so I get to emphasize it. Couldn't agree more. I mean, I really think that that's, that's crucial to understand that companies will only do what, what the market structures allow them to do, and we can't expect them to be leaders on this in the absence of public policy, right? Uh, that's just, uh, so I 100% uh, agree. And we see how the market can do that. Coal is now more expensive than many other clean energy forms of, of generating power. That's what's changing it. And so, I mean, it, it's not implausible and it's, it's eminently possible. Yep. Well, on that note, I think we are at the end of our time. Um, and I'm sorry, because there are a couple of questions that we weren't able to get to. I want to thank you, Jeff and, and Bob and Elizabeth for your contributions today. It's really uh, a pleasure to be sitting here with you today uh, to welcome you back to the Wilson Center to have uh, your insights shared and thank you for your questions um, to those watching online. I, I want to also put a plug in Jeff, Jeff's point about sort of climate not being its own issue area. Um, the Wilson Center has a project, 21st Century Diplomacy, Foreign Policy is Climate Policy, that Jeff wrote a great piece for um, that is worth checking out uh, if you want to Google that. So thank you again. Thanks for being here, and thanks for watching online. And uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you again soon. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>